Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to briefly introduce Corinne McSherry. Corinne is Intellectual Property Director at EFF, specializing in IP and free speech issues. Prior to joining EFF, Corinne was a civil lit litigator at the law firm of Bingham & McCutcheon. Corinne has a BA from UC Santa Cruz, a PhD from UC San Diego, and a JD from Stanford Law School. While in law school, Corinne published Who Owns Academic Work? Battling for Control of Intellectual Property with Harvard University Press. Um, please join me in welcoming Corinne. We'll be talking for about 45 minutes and then leave some time for question and answer. Um, can I set this up as a... Oh, right, because I have this. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so, hi. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, I am actually I'm a Stanford alum, and I was a SLATA member. So when uh, Alex Moss asked me if I wanted to come and talk to you guys, of course, I had to say yes. Um, I've been a lot, I was at a lot of these lunches, pretty much my regular lunch for um, a lot of time there. Um, so it's fun to be back here. Stanford's changed a lot since I was here, but um, this, the, the same chairs, I noticed. Those chairs were, were a new thing when I was here, and now they're old. Um, so, okay, so I'm here to talk about the so-called graduated response, or the Six Strikes program, um, which you guys might have heard about. It's, a, it's basically a huge deal that the ISPs and the um, major content, big content organizations came to last year, and it's due to start being properly rolled out this year, this July. Um, and so I think there's a lot of sort of misinformation and kind of confusion. What's it going to involve? Is my ISP going to be a copyright cop? And the answer is yes and no. Um, and so I kind of want to break it down for you guys so, so to clear up some of the misinformation and then we can ask questions. And also, you know, if you're a SLATA member, my guess is you're probably interested in other EFF issues. And so if there's time, you know, I'm happy to talk about other IP stuff that EFF's involved in if you want to. Um, okay, so to kind of understand the program, we kind of have to back up um, a bit. And because really, this thing's been a long time in coming. And really, you have to go all the way back to 1999, which is when the Napster service launched so famously. And, and Hollywood completely freaked out. Um, and I always say that Hollywood made a fundamental mistake when Napster launched, which is that so I sort of imagine them as sort of their big executive offices, and over here are the lawyers, and over here are the business people, and they went here when they should have gone here. Um, and so they just went straight for the lawyers. I said, you know, surely this is infringing our tech, um, this peer-to-peer -peer file sharing thing is terrible and facilitates all kinds of infringement, and we need to stop it right now. And the lawyers said, okay. So um, immediately they started going after the technology companies that were providing peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services um, because they were on the argument that they were facilitating infringement. Now, we all know P2P was also used for non-infringing uses, but it's true. There's really no question that it was also used to commit all kinds of infringement. This is an empirical fact. Um, and so Hollywood sued a whole series of companies out of existence. First, there was Napster, Napster and then there was Grokster and Kazaa and Morpheus, and then LimeWire most recently, and so is you know, they've been very successful at suing the, these companies out of existence. They have been completely, complete failures at actually really stemming peer-to-peer -peer online infringement. At least this strategy didn't work at all. Instead, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing grew exponentially. Every year after year after year, went around the world. There was a point at which, for example, LimeWire was, on a third, was estimated to be on a third of the computers worldwide, which is a pretty big number. Um, that was the free version, of course. Um, so that strategy wasn't working too well. <clears throat> but, you know, it made a lot of lawyers a lot of money. Um, and then they decided to give more money to their lawyers by sending the lawyers after the users. They said, okay, well, suing the technology companies, you know, is only part of the strategy. We need to go after the users directly. And so they started doing that. They started suing individual users in 2004. Um, this was a PR disaster. Um, on the one hand, I think it probably did raise a lot of people's awareness about peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, and they sort of put their litigation campaign, they phrased it as uh, primarily about education, which is kind of a weird way to think about using the courts, but anyway, um, they were pretty straightforward about it, but um, they, sued, they sued users. 
this was a PR disaster because, as you would expect, a bunch of uh, folks got caught up in the net who appeared to be innocent. Like, and, and also, even the people that maybe were committing the infringement were really not very sympathetic defendants. They were like kids and teenagers and grandmas. And you know, they, so there was story after story would come out about someone who appeared to have been improperly sued, um, but was settling because they couldn't afford to defend themselves. There was just an endless amount of material for folks like EFF to explain why this was a really bad idea and why perhaps the, the right answer to online infringement was not to sue music fans. Um, and so eventually, they decided that this was not a good strategy either. So 2008, the IAA calls off the individual lawsuits. But um, there, actually, that's a little bit incorrect because there are, there are two um, lawsuits that went forward after that against a guy named Joel Tenenbaum and a woman named um, Jamie Thomas Rassett. Um, and those cases sort of got interesting because the juries convicted both of those people for online infringement, found them liable, and they got hit with millions of dollars in statutory damages. And so that's raised a lot of awareness about the problem of statutory damages, which we can talk about another time um, or later. Um, so, but anyway, for, but for the most part, the lawsuits against individual users were ended. And at the same time, um, as initially a sort of a bit of a face saving strategy, but, but I think also in earnest, they said, here's what we need to do. We need to start working with the ISPs. Going to the courts is not the right answer. We need to go to the internet service providers who are facilitating this bad, all this bad acts, these bad acts by providing the technology, not the peer-to-peer -peer technology, but the, you know, the, the, um, the services on which people you know, do their downloading and sharing and so on. Uh, we think we need to get them in on the act and, and get them to help us go after um, their customers. Now, the ISPs were um, reluctant to do this um, because they faced a lot of criticism for doing it you know, immediately, right? Sort of what you don't want your, you want your ISP to be your ISP, um, to be working for you and providing you with services. And it seemed sort of incompatible if your ISP was also maybe snooping on you and tracking what kinds of things you were doing with their services, you know, and ISPs didn't want to get involved in that. Also, it's expensive. Anything that was sort of being proposed sounded like it would be expensive. They'd have to cut off customers maybe, and that means they lose money. That's not a good idea. How, you know, how would you administer a system without snooping on customers? And you, ISPs didn't want to really be in the business of doing that. Um, but, so I think that, you know, they were very reluctant to engage in these kinds of negotiations, but nonetheless, they did. At least some of them did. Not every ISP has um, did, but several of the major ones did, like AT&T and Verizon and Comcast. <coughs> um, and so, so that was 2008. They started the negotiations. Um, and at the same time that these negotiations are happening, particularly around 2009 and into 2010, um, what you also have is, uh, and this is a little bit my speculation, but I think that there's, it's true um, from what I hear, is um, the gov government gets involved in putting pressure on the ISPs. And the scuttlebutt that I hear is that, you know, they said, look, either you make a deal or Congress is going to have to act. And you won't like that, right? That won't be better for you. And remember, this is all before... January 18th, right? This is a year and a half ago. And the world, I think, has somewhat changed. Now Congress doesn't want to touch the internet with a 10-foot pole unless it's under security. Um, but they don't want to get involved in IP anything for now. So yay. Um, but um, at the time, you know, things looked a little bit different. So the ISPs were under a great deal of pressure to come to the table and make a deal. Um, and, and there were some government people that got actively involved in brokering that deal. Andrew Cuomo. Uh, very famously um, uh, got involved and claimed a lot of credit for it. But other people were also working on it behind the scenes. Um, and so in July 2011, the deal is announced, the so-called Memorandum of Understanding. Um, so major ISPs, the RAAA, the MPAA, all sort of come to an agreement about what they're going to do. Um, and this sort of graduated response, or some people call it the Six Strikes Plan. OK, so what does that plan look like exactly? Um, here, hold on just one second. 
let me show you. I'm very proud to have been one of the probably 20 people in the world who's actually read this whole thing. This is it. Um, and I hope I understand it. Um, but most people, of course, weren't going to read this thing because it's too friggin' long. Um, not unlike Sopa and Pippa. So what's it do? Well, f the basic thing it does is, is, is sort of sixfold, I suppose. It says several things. First, it creates this Center for Copyright Information. And the Center for Copyright Information is going to administer the whole system. And I'm just going to call it Six Strikes, which isn't actually strictly accurate for reasons that will become clear, but it's just faster than saying MOU or graduated response, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and the director, it's later announced, of this center is going to be a woman named Jill Haley, uh, who's got some pretty good credentials, you know, as being a, both a consumer advocate, but also, you know, being very sympathetic to big content. So she's been worked on all sides. Um, and I've spoken with her, nice person. Uh, then there's an executive board, um, an executive committee, which is made up of representatives from the ISPs, from the RAAA, and from the MPAA. You guys all know what the RAAA and the MPAA are, right? Okay, yeah, sure you do. Um, so that's the executive board. They are the decision makers. Uh, then there's an advisory board. Um, they are advisors. They get to consult, but they don't get to decide anything. Um, and later it's announced who's on the advisory board. Again, some good people. Um, a woman named Gigi Sohn from Public Knowledge, who I know personally, who's an absolute advocate for consumers, um, and some other you know, good consumer representatives. Um, but unfortunately, this is, you know, they're, they're only advisors, but nonetheless, they're, they're in the mix at least having a conversation. Okay, and so what's the process supposed to be? Well, it's, we don't totally know yet. Um, because it's still being implemented. But the basic outlines are this. Um, the ISP, or RIAA, or the MPAA, the major content holders, use a proprietary system to identify allegedly infringing activity associated with a particular IP address. Okay. Um, then they send a notice of this to the ISP. And the ISP's job is to then take action. Um, and there's a series of actions for them to take, a series of graduated responses that are more and more severe depending on um, how many complaints they've gotten. So the very first thing is they send a copyright alert to the user. And you know, one of the, I think, legitimate ideas about this is that some people may not know that there's infringing activity associated with their IP address. So we're going to let them know. Um, that said, you know, the copyright alert has to do things like, say, there's infringement on, you know, you've been associated with infringing activity. Here's all the bad consequences that can come from that. You know, it's going to be a little bit more than just there's infringement, but, and here's all the scary things that can happen to you. Um, so that's for the first allegation of infringement that they get. For the second one, they have to send another alert, but this is called the acknowledgement step. And basically, they have to set in, in place some procedure by which the subscriber has to acknowledge that they have received this notification. <clears throat> like, for example, maybe before you get access to your account again, you have to go to a web page that you know, we can click through and admit that you've gotten an alert on your account. So that's not going to be scary at all. Um, and then if the, if the infringing activity allegedly incurs, basically if the ISP gets another notice associated with the same address, um, the mitigation measures start. That's the phrase, mitigation measures. I wouldn't make this up, I promise. Um, and the ISPs have a lot of choices about what they're going to do at that point. They can choose between restricting service, uh, temporarily suspending service, um, having people sort of complete a copyright education, sort of a copyright quiz um, before their service can go, go forward. And I don't know if you guys remember YouTube a while back had a sort of copyright quiz that they had people taking. If it's anything like that, it's going to be really scary. Um, and but there, what there isn't, and this is something that I think people get confused about, is that there, there isn't supposed to be permanent termination of anybody's account. So it could be suspended, but not permanently terminated based on nothing more than one of these allegations. Um, EFF actually has a, um, an action in place to try to get all of the ISPs commit that it will ne that will never be on the table. Um, because we're concerned that this is a starting point and we don't know where it's going to end up. Um, so go to EFF.org if you want to participate in that. 
Um, so, but you know, for, for most people, we're talking about access to your internet, right? That is huge. Even suspending that would be a very significant thing for subscribers. And, and um, this is recognized, sort of. Um, there is, because there's a, what's called the independent review system. And this is a means by which subscribers can basically protest when they've gotten hit with one of these notices, if they think that it's wrong. So they basically, they have 10 days after they receive one of these alerts or notices or whatever um, to request independent review. And they pay, have to pay $35 for it and, um, and submit a bunch of material sort of explaining why it is, defending themselves, explaining why it is that, that it's wrong or something incorrect. Yes? No. I mean, we don't actually know exactly what it's going to look like, but I don't think so. I think what they're going to get is your account has been associated with infringing activity. Ideally, there will be some explanation of what the infringing activity is. That would be good, <laughs> so you can know. Um, um, but this is something that we don't know, and it's, I, I think is exactly the right question. You know, how, first of all, well, I'll get to the problems in a one second. <laughs> That's one of them. Um, you can ask for six independent review, and you can. There are six predetermined defenses that you can assert. So things like um, the work in question. So I think they will actually have to tell you what the work is, because one of the things is the work in question is from is in the public domain, but it can't be in the public domain for just any reason. It has to be because it's a pre nineteen twenty three work. I mean, there are other ways of things being in the public domain than that, but that's not one of the on the list of defenses. Um, you can <coughs> explain that you have an unsecured Wi Fi connection. Therefore, it can't be you. It's probably your roommate or you know whoever. You don't know. Um, but you can only assert that once. And then presumably, you need to secure your um, Wi-Fi connection. But you can't make that complaint again. Um, so there's sort of limited predetermined um, defenses that you are allowed to assert. Um, the, we now know that this independent review system is going to be administered by the American Arbitration Association, which is perfectly reputable. You know, group. We're not really sure how it's all going to work because I can't imagine how, why they would do this given the amount of money they're going to be getting. But um, that's the third thing. Who's paying for it? <coughs> so the costs of this are going to be split between the ISPs and the content holders. Um, as a practical matter, that means the subscribers are going to pay for it because I can assure you Verizon is not going to take it out of their profits. They're going to pass the costs on to, to their subscribers. Fortunately, they have millions, so maybe it'll only be a dollar each of you. But you know, it will. That's who's going to be paying for it. Um, at least half. So that's the basic. That's the big picture. Um, the ISPs have announced that they're going to, you know, roll out their implementation of all of this in July 2012. And so we're going to be watching to see what it is that different ISPs do, because they have a, a wide variety of things to choose from. So it'll be interesting to see what they, you know whether there's variability in how the ISPs approach it, um, and if there's a reason for people to vote with their feet if they can. All too often, people can't. You know, they can't switch ISPs because they don't have choices. Um, but there are places where people have those choices. Not every ISP agreed. Um, Cox, for example, decided that it wasn't worth it for them. Um, a lot of smaller ISPs aren't part of this. So like Sonic, Sonic, hey, Sonic. Um, Sonic didn't, didn't agree to participate. Um, over time, there may be pressure for everyone to get involved, but I think people are sort of waiting and seeing what, what is actually involved, how expensive this is, how much trouble it is for the ISPs. You know, my guess is if I'm other folks, I'm waiting. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is keep in mind, this is all about peer-to-peer, -peer, which sort of really feels like, you know, 2009. I mean, really, peer to peer, that's what you're worried about? You know, <laughs> but anyway, it's all, that's where it's focused. It could be expanded later, though, to focus on, on other kinds of activities. Okay, so um, EFF has been pretty critical of this deal from the start. Um, we've got a lot of problems with it. Um, I think it's very nice that Gigi Sohn is on the advisory board. I'd be a lot happier if she was on the executive committee. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of problems. Um, and that's really the starting one, which is that the subscribers are going to be paying for this, but they don't have a say in how it's run, and they didn't have a say in negotiating it. And you know, I think that, particularly in the wake of the battle over SOPA and PIPA, you know, we have learned that internet users want a seat at the table, and they didn't get one. They weren't, you know, ever invited. Now there was some initial or 
very, very late consultation with some consumer groups, but that's it. Um, and so that's sort of a fundamental problem. Um, secondly, there's no accountability for if the infringement allegations are false. So the burden is on the subscriber to prove why they aren't infringing, right? And, you know, and they have all kinds of you know, consequences for them if they can't establish that. But there's no consequences for the content holders if they make you know, a false allegation. I mean, even like in the DMCA context, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the DMCA safe harbors. If you send a false takedown notice, there can be consequences. We don't have that here. Um, there's no transparency. So for example, the system that's going to be used to identify infringers, there is going to be independent review of that, supposedly, and a report generated, but you'll never get to see it. Right? You know, it's, it's, all, it's going to be secret. So this proprietary system that's being used to generate infringement allegations for potentially you know, millions of people, those people never get to see what it is that's, that's targeting them. So that's a problem. If you were in a court, that would be utterly unacceptable. Right? That would be a natural part of discovery is that information would come out. Not here. <coughs> um, and keep in mind that based on the experience of suing individual users back when the RIAA was doing that in 2004, 2008, we know that there will be false positive generated. There were then, there will be now. Right? But again, there will be no way for people, or it will be very difficult for people to, to fight back and sort of find the flaws in the system. I mean, we had, we had I don't know if you guys remember, a, a few years back there was um, some researchers who had their printers targeted for infringing activity. And their printers got takedown notices. I mean, look, these systems are not fail safe. Um, so that's a problem. So then say you get targeted and you, want, you do want to fight back. You've got 10 days to prepare a defense. That would be hard for a lawyer. That is not going to be easy for you know regular Joe subscriber. Um, the number of defenses you can have is, is limited. And so you don't get the full range of copyright defenses that you normally would. Um, another problem is this requirement, essentially, that you secure your Wi-Fi, that you can only assert an open Wi-Fi defense once. I mean, I don't know what that's going to do for Starbucks or like all the other folks that have open Wi-Fi. Um, it's really not clear to me how this is going to work out. But either way, actually, you know, there's an enormous amount of benefit to open Wi-Fi. Right. The public benefits in all kinds of ways when there's open Wi-Fi. There's open Wi-Fi in the Supreme Court steps, and that's a good thing. Okay, So um, this system, unfortunately, is going to discourage um, the, the building, I, I fear, of open Wi-Fi networks. I mean, I can't. I'd love it if the Supreme Court got hit with an infringement notice. Probably not. Um, and then the third thing is I'm, I'm very worried about even the initial steps that are just supposed to be the education steps. because. I'm really worried they're not going to be educational. They're going to be propaganda. Um, and the reason that I'm worried about that is because I have seen the kinds of educational materials that the Recording Industry of Association of America has um, tried to fob off on the public schools. They're not neutral. And I think that subscribers should have an opportunity to get access to neutral information and not biased information. Um, and, not, and I just worry that this is going to be a vehicle for ISPs to basically be scaring their subscribers. And that's not right, and that's not fair. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why subscribers should be worried and should actually be calling on their ISPs to, um, to pr press the reset button on this whole deal. Um, and I think that the ISPs have more leverage to do that now in the wake of SOPA PIPA than they did a year ago. Um, there's a lot of power now um, in, in the, on the internets. And um, a lot of people who are energized and want to fight back, as long as they get a seat at the table. And the ISPs would have to give them that seat if they want to mobilize their subscribers to, to push back against this deal that they made. Um, I think that would be great. I haven't gotten any indication that the ISPs are going to do this. <laughs> but I think it would be great. And I also think that another thing that subscribers should be doing, if they can, is to vote with their feet and go to an alternative um, provider, if you can, who hasn't signed off on this deal. Basically, not just because of the details of the deal itself, but again, because subscribers shouldn't be having the system put in place that is going to affect them in so many different ways when they never got a chance to sign off on it. You know, They didn't get a vote. They didn't get consulted, even. Nothing. That's not acceptable. OK, so that's on my you know, high horse. Um, from a legal perspective, I think that what is in sort of a policy perspective 
is what, what's most interesting here is what it's really about is a bigger battle with respect to copyright and the internet, and that is whose burden to police? Whose burden is it going to be to go after online infringement? Um, so traditionally, that burden goes on the copyright holder. That's, you know, copyright holders are supposed to be responsible for identifying and policing infringement. The DMCA safe harbors enshrine that principle, and it's been supported by several recent court decisions. Um, but the big content holders really object to this <laughs> a lot. They say, look, it's too, even, even small content holders, actually. They have a bigger, better case to make, actually. Um, they say, look, it shouldn't be our burden, and it's too much of a burden. We can't do it. It's like playing whack-a-mole, trying to fight online infringement here and here and here and get it shut down. We can't do it. We don't have the resources. ISPs, you need to help. And you know, that's really what was behind this deal. It's also what was behind, for example, legislation like SOPA and, and PIPA that I'm sure you're well familiar with, so I'm not going to tell you the details of it. But that legislation was fundamentally about, particularly SOPA in the beginning, pushing the burden back on service providers of various kinds of payment processors, search engines, to get more, much more actively involved in policing infringement. And um, the service providers, understandably, didn't want to do that, not least because it was going to be expensive, um, aside from any other reason, and difficult and you know, sort of virtually impossible for them to accomplish in the way that it was contemplated there. But that is this issue about burden shifting is not going to go away. I think we're going to hear, you know, after everything's sort of on hold until the campaign season is over, but we're going to see this again uh, next year, push us back more internet legislation. And the story is going to be service providers have an obligation to do more. They have an obligation to get involved and um, you know, stop legitimate uses of their services. And we're going to hear the service provider saying, no, we don't. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's case after case and all kinds of policy reasons why you know, it's probably not a good idea to have service providers getting too involved in being copyright cops. Um, not least because it's going to involve some privacy problems for subscribers. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I do think that this is something we're going to keep hearing about. It may be, and, and another thing to sort of watch for is whether, um, as I fear, this is just the beginning, right? So we, this is sort of, we have a year or two, we have this system get in place. Um, but as long as I've been practicing IP law, which is only 10 years, not as many as some of my colleagues, but uh, I've never seen Hollywood settle. I've never seen them say, OK, that's good. We got enough now. That'll be fine. That just doesn't happen. And I don't think there's any reason to think it's going to happen now. So you know, I expect we're going to see arguments that this should be expanded. Or it could be a complete another disaster. And that would be great. <laughs> and then it'll just go away. Um, but you know, if it's not a complete and utter disaster, I think we're going to see arguments that it would be expanded. And that's something to pay attention to because I think, um, if so, it's going to have to be a little bit more public. This deal was negotiated in secret. So that means that it may be that subscribers will have an opportunity to make noise. Um, and they should, so they should be you know, sort of keeping their eyes open and getting ready to make noise um, if they get a whiff of any kind of expansion. Um, so I think I just wanted to say one more thing since I have a couple of minutes. And then we can do questions if you want. Um, which is that one of the things that sort of was happening while this deal was getting negotiated and, and after the IAA sort of called off the dogs on individual users, we saw a rise of another group of people, another group of content holders, which are or, or smaller content holders. Um, it's what we call the rise of the copyright trolls. Um, what, one of the things that was happening is the RIAA, RIAA said, this isn't worth it for us. But they had set up a model of how to sue individual users. And the model is this. You sue a bunch of people at once as does. Then you ask a court to, give you, to let you issue subpoenas to service providers to get identifying information for those, the IP addresses associated with those does. And then you contact those does and you say, settle, or we're going to name you in a lawsuit. Um, and so this sort of to set up this model. Everyone said, oh, great. And as the I really tie this to the economic downturn. I think there was a lot of lawyers who were out of work. And so they said, I know what let's do. 
Um, we know there's still all this online infringement, especially using BitTorrent. So we're going to actually use this system. We're going to take a page from the RIAA. Um, but we're going to do it as a serious business model. And so what we've seen over the past, since 2010, since March 2010, I think was the first, um, over 200,000 people have been sued in copyright troll lawsuits. And what they do is they name up to 25,000 people at once in a single lawsuit. And then they move for early discovery. They get the subpoena. Um, subpoenas issued. And um, they get people's identifying information. And then they shake them down. And if they even get only 10% of those people to pay up, that's a pretty good, good deal for a $300 filing fee. So um, th this has been a sort of you know, sad um, uh, development. And we've been fighting, EFF's been fighting it by um, right and left. But there's two things that I think are important about this and relevant to what we're talking about here. One is that this is a place where actually ISPs get credit because they're fighting for their users. There are several, I mean, they're doing it in their own interest too because it's expensive to respond to all these subpoenas. But um, there are cases around the country where ISPs are fighting back against these subpoenas and saying we're not going to comply with them. And one of the things they're saying is because they're wrong, there's all kinds of due process. Problems. We could get into that if you want. But, um, but they're fighting back on, and really on behalf of their users. And so they deserve some credit <laughs> for doing that. Even if, you know, over here they're not doing so great for the users with their graduated response program, but over here they're actually doing some good. Um, and then the other thing, uh, that, other reason I think this is relevant is so there was a hearing in one of these cases last week, a case called AF Holdings, which is in the District of Columbia. And um, the judge was not especially sympathetic, I'm afraid. But one of the things that she said to AT&T's lawyer, she said, what is AT&T doing to help these poor copyright owners? So once again, we have the, it's, you know, at the judge level, the judicial level, we have a judge who's saying, you have an obligation. What are you doing to police copyright infringement? So of course, AT&T's lawyer said, we're doing what we're legally required to do, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, again, it sort of circles back for me that this is you know this big question about burden shifting is not going away anytime soon. Um, so um, that's actually an interesting case too because it may go up on appeal, and if so, it's going to be exciting. Um, so that's that's it. Wait for July. See what it looks like. Vote with your feet if you can. Um, you know, go to the FF website. We'll break it down for you um, once we see the actual implementation. EFF.org website. Yes, Julie. Uh, just a question about the <coughs> made mistake. When, yeah, what stage is it in? When is it going to, you know, when is it supposed to be implemented? All that, like, when makes a kind of announcement, our users going to be aware that this is now the rule or this is how it's going to work? Well, supposedly. Um, there, so there was an announcement in April where they release the names of the people on the boards and committees and so on. Um, and, um, and they said then that in July, in July 2012, they will, that when they do the rollout, they will announce the actual implementation. And I think that the ISPs will be do, sort of saying, this is what we are going to do. My guess is it's taking a while because they would like to be doing similar things. And so they're you know, having to negotiate this. It must just be like herding cats. It must be really painful. Yeah. No, it, no, no. It's um, you know for good or ill, <laughs> it's the IAA and the MPAA. It's the people who who were part of the memorandum of understanding. Those are the people who are empowered to do this. So I mean, in some ways, that's good because we've seen like with the DMCA takedowns, you know, people totally random people abuse the system all the time who don't understand copyright and you know have no clue. Um, on the other hand, we also see that the major content holders abuse the system too. <laughs> so it's not really all that comforting. Uh, but it will be limited to them and their, you know, little proprietary system. Yes. I'm interested in uh, what you said about uh, kind of the rise in copyright trolls. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the major malfeasance of these parties? Is it kind of the way in which they're shaking down people? I mean, it sounds like they're, you know, so that they're not actually validly enforcing rights that they possess. What, what are the, what are the big bads that they're doing? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I really have a problem with copyright trolls. Um, so. There's the problem with what they're doing is it completely violates due process and the First Amendment. Um, in well, let's just focus on the due process violations. 
Um, first of all, the rules of joinder don't actually allow you to join together 25,000 people in one lawsuit based on nothing more than the fact that they all participated in the same case once. Um, and we've got about half the courts in the country with us on that. And unfortunately, one very influential judge in DC who was against us. Um, the second thing is that they sue all of these people when they have every reason to know that 90% of the people that they're suing in a given jurisdiction have no association with that jurisdiction. So the first lawsuit was against 14,000 people in the District of Columbia. And we got involved as um, amicus in that case. And we um, had our staff technologist do a simple geolocation search using basic services, free services that are available online. And it was running against the IP addresses, which were exhibits. And discovered that only 10% of the people actually lived in the District of Columbia, which makes sense because it's, I forget exactly how this works, but basically 10% of people are going to be located in any given jurisdiction, just, just rules of probability. So, and, and in fact, we had a, a, the lawyer for AT&T, or Time Warner Cable, sorry, stood up in court and said, none of our customers are located in this jurisdiction. I can tell you because we checked. We don't have anybody here. Um, so the court doesn't have jurisdiction. And what that means is a practical matter is like, so okay, you're, you live in Maine, and you get a letter saying you've been sued in the District of Columbia, you know, or Hawaii, or whatever, and now you have to, and you've been accused of copyright infringement along with 20,000 other people. I mean, the logistics of trying to defend yourself in that context, it's impossible. And think about it too, like say you're innocent, but the other 19,000 people aren't. They're not liable. Well, you know, is a judge really going to treat you differently and be able to treat you, give you the individual attention that you deserve, that every defendant deserves? Probably not. You know, so there's that, I mean, even if you're guilty, you still have the same due process rights as everybody else. And if you're innocent, you know, you're, you're in an even worse position. And another thing that's happened with these copyright trolls is really the folks who've jumped on the bandwagon are um, the porn studios. So now you're getting hit with a notice that says, we are going to name you in a lawsuit um, where that the movie involves something I would probably not like to pronounce if I'm going to be on YouTube, but you know, <laughs> something not very nice. And, um, and if, you know, I heard about a guy who was, who was it, he sued, yeah, there was a, there was a soldier who um, got one of these notices, and this is before Do Not Don't Tell was repealed, and he was going to be named in a lawsuit that had to do with gay porn. And he was quite sure, sure that it wasn't him, and it was his roommate, but he's not in a very good position to fight back now, is he? Um, and, you know, alternatively, you can pay 2000 bucks or 2500 bucks, And the trolls know that most people are going to, are going to do that. That's the choice that they're going to make. They're just going to pay up, because it's much cheaper than paying a lawyer. I mean, there's, you know... There aren't that many free IP attorneys in the country. I think I know most of them, and we don't have time to, to do, take all these troll cases. So, you know, it's like, I think I have a lot of problems with the IAA, but at least I don't believe they were suing people as part of a business model. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. Yes? So they do have clients, you know, sort of. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the lawyers crafted this business model, and then I think they approach clients with it. And we don't know the details of what the arrangement is, but I suspect it's some species of contingency. Okay, so they're not, they're not buying up low price, you know, content and, and going after people the way that patent trolls buy up patents. Yeah. No. It's different that way. It's different that way. Um, also, this memorandum of understanding we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. does um, the NPAA and the RIAA from actually bringing individual suits against um, users prior to taking all these steps, or those are sort of recommendations? They could still sue. I mean, this is an agreement between the IAA and the ISPs. Right. Right? Not, so there, it's not like there's a settlement. I see. So they could still go outside the system and sue individual users. Yeah, they could. Oh no, please. Uh, but they probably won't. I mean, like, as a practical matter, it is true that it's not, unless you're a copyright troll, it's usually not really in your interest to right. sue individuals. It, it's not exactly cost effective. And the PR is bad. And the PR is bad. Yes. Yes. Uh, you're using the word copyright troll in this case. You, you really mean class action, right? Where you have this humongous class of, mm -hmm. of those who are named rather than individual defendants. Well, 
I mean, in a way, I mean, you're suing a class of people. Right. Like it's an in, it's, but it's an individual plaintiff suing a large group of defendants. And they actually, one of the trolls tried to bring this as a, what we call it a reverse class action. Um, but they made the mistake of bringing it in the Seventh Circuit. The Seventh Circuit has specifically disapproved of reverse class actions. And that's because a lot of the reasons why we sign off on class actions in, in the, in the, when it's a plaintiff is that you could sort of, it makes sense to have sort of one counsel for everybody. But when you've got 20,000 does, the notion that they're going to sort of coordinate to get one single counsel and pay one single counsel um, really doesn't work very well. And they're also likely to have a wide variety of different defenses. So defendant classes don't work as well as plaintiff classes where you can sort of craft a group of people in advance who are likely to have the same sort of common questions of fact and law. So, but the, you know, it makes sense, the analogy makes sense, it's just when you think about the policy reasons behind class actions, they don't work well in this context. Yes? So going to enforceability, if you, if you were to sue everyone who participated in like a bit torrent storm, uh -huh. Okay, so what you would do, um, what they, what you would do is you would actually, you know, once you get people's identifying information, then you could, if you were actually doing a real lawsuit, as opposed to what these are, um, is you could name those people as individual defendants. And, um, and then there are probably statutory damages would click in. Um, so there you know, would be a set sort of form of damages that would kick in. But it, it never gets there. None of these cases have gone anywhere near actual litigation. I think probably, I don't know, maybe 20 actual people have ever been named at the most in, in real lawsuits because that's not really what it's about. It doesn't, it's expensive to sue, it's actually expensive to actually litigate against people as opposed to just filing a great big lawsuit and then sending out automatic letters. I mean, they have it like completely automated. You can go to a website, just run your credit card through and you know, sign a totally bogus settlement agreement and, and you're out. Um, and that's what most people are going to do, and that's what they are banking on. Yes? Isn't it more like a scam in that case? It could be just kind of like say, hey, I'm not going to respond to this, or? You could. Um, you could do that, and some people do. Um, it's a risk. And um, some people do that because they can't afford it, and they, can't, they don't have any off choice. Um, some people do that and just figure, well, they'll never actually sue me. And, and that's why I actually have been a few people named, I think, is because they have to kind of, you know, go through the window dressing of occasionally falling through on their threats. Um, but a lot of people are going to be afraid to take that risk. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you consult with a lawyer, a lawyer is going to say, well, you know, <laughs> um, you could pay me, but it's going to cost a lot more than settling. Maybe you should settle, you know, and, they, and there they are in that position. So, um, and again, keep in mind that trolls only need to make back like 10%. Right? They only get 10% of people to sign off, and it's a good day. Yes? They're talking about fair use in, it, in the uh, agreement, mm -hmm. or is it fair use a concept that's not even part of this thinking? It's not really part of this thinking. It's that's too complicated. <laughs> yes? That's you. There was a note I'm on the technical geek boards about a judge in New York throwing out well, a number of the copyright trolls have been accused of that. Um, and, and yeah, some patent trolls have done that yeah, as well. I, yeah, it was just yesterday. I think he said they were only filing for 25 people. Mm -hmm. He said you can have the first one for your $350. You want to sue the others, you got to have $350 each. <laughs> Great. And this was a patent case? Uh, porn troll. Oh, okay. Then it was probably copyright. Yes. Two days ago. Oh, good for him. He dismissed four cases on the grounds that uh, it was a troll and that you couldn't collectively sue all of these defendants. Right, it's a jointer problem, probably. Yeah, it's great. I mean, the thing he is... He wrote a 26-page scathing opinion. Oh, I need to read defendants. that. I need to read that. There have been, there's a number of the judges that tr have written pretty astonishing opinions. It took, it took the judges, I think, a little while to kind of cotton to what was happening. Um, and now that they have more and more judges, like the Northern District of California, completely does not want to see these people. Um, they and have 
Oh, I think every judge on the bench now has said this is ridiculous. I think early on, the thing that happens in, in litigation is like a motion for early discovery is kind of early. The judges aren't really necessarily paying close attention to what's going on. Although it seems to me that if a, if a caption came in front of me and that said 20, you know, does one to 25,000, I might pay attention. But nonetheless, you know, judges are busy people. They're not necessarily paying attention to what's going on at first. Um, but once sort of it's brought to their attention, and especially now I think the judges around the country are talking to each other and saying, like, what, you know, this is an abuse of the court system. Problem is there are some judges who have said, no, no, you know, we'll worry about the joinder issues later when the you know, defendants are actually named, they can go forward and they can raise all of these defenses, and of course that never happens. Right? That's why we say to the judges, look, these motions for early discovery, this is the last chance the defendant practically are going to have for you to think about these due process problems because there's never going to be another chance. Um, and I think that either have been, I missed this one, it's, I, I'll dig it up as soon as we're done. But um, there have been a number of judges who have just been outraged. I was in court um, in, uh, before Judge um, uh, Bernie Zimmerman, and he had initially signed off on discovery um, in a porn troll case. And then he started getting all these does filing, you know, anonymous motions to quash and explaining that he was the warrant of the right jurisdiction. And so he issued an order to show cause to the, um, the plaintiff and said, why shouldn't I just throw this thing out? What is this? And put a call to halt to all the subpoenas in the meantime. And then we get the lawyer in, in, uh, um, called in front of him, and I'm at the hearing too, and, she, and he says, I've got all these people telling me that you don't have jurisdiction, uh, that I don't have jurisdiction over them. Like, what is happening here? And, um, and why do I have jurisdiction over any of these people? And the lawyer says, well, you know, I think they purposely, they, they, they have, you know, contacts with California and they sort of purposely availed themselves of, of, of California's jurisdiction. And the judge says, well, why? They don't even know. These are people in Maine they're telling me. I don't, I don't, they don't know anything. They have no relationship to California. And he says, well, yeah, they do because they participate in the BitTorrent swarm and, uh, for porn and everybody knows that por most porn is made in California. <laughs> Hand to God. <laughs> it, was, it was, yeah. I mean, this, you know, this is who we have doing this. Um, but they're making a lot of money doing it. Um, but it is true. And then when you, so when you get in front of a judge and you make those kinds of arguments, you make them mad. <laughs> and, you know, and then you start getting opinions issued where people refer to this as shakedown schemes and extortion. And, you know, judges say, I don't appreciate having my court used in this way. So that's good. We need more. Yes? Thank you. In, in what ways will the electronic information uh, strategize going forward, especially vis-a-vis -vis burden sharing, if there is any way? Will Creative Commons law at all play a place in this, in defining certain aspects of copyright? And in terms of individuals um, strategizing, is there a list of ISPs besides Sonic and uh, Cox, um, the DFF publishes, that, um, to allow uh, um, we've thought about doing that. We haven't done it, um, but we've thought about doing it. And, uh, you know, it's it's tough because so many people are kind of geographically locked into their ISP. But, you know, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be putting pressure on them. So, And then we've had, we've had actual large people can call on their ISPs to do stuff. I think the big picture with burden shifting um, is I tend to think that the, the right answer to online infringement is actually doesn't have anything to do with burden shifting at all. I think the right line to answer to online infringement um, it doesn't actually have to do with law or legislation. I think it has to do with your business model. The, the only thing that has worked um, for the record industry, for example, has been to finally, finally, kicking and screaming, agree to provide services that, that can actually compete with LimeWire and so on. That's the only thing. It took them 10 years to finally come around to doing it. And meanwhile, they were losing all kinds of money. And that's the mistake. But that's like, at least we should learn that that's the right answer. The answer is going to happen through innovation. It's not going to happen through legislation. And I know that sounds a bit you know, pat, but I think it's empirically true. And one of the exciting things that we are seeing now is um, there's more and more evidence you know, moving beyond the anecdotal, it's almost getting sort of enough numbers that we can be empirical of people who are, you know, acknowledging that there's going to be online infringement, accepting that, but nonetheless coming up with creative ways to go ahead and be successful anyway. Accepting, okay, there's going to be a certain amount of, you know, people who are going to trade my work for free, and I'm not, and they're not going to pay me for it. But there also will be some people who will 
who will pay me for it, and that's enough for me to go ahead and make money. I mean, the people who are really losers are the big studios. Right? But there are lots of ways in which smaller folks have more opportunities than ever before to actually get their product out there and get directly compensated, as opposed to you know, having it all filtered off by their agents and the production companies and all the other in-between in, in people. You know, Louis C.K., I'm sure you guys know about that example, where he made millions of dollars because he produced it himself, but he's not the only one. There's lots of them. Um, there's a report that um, uh, a fellow named Mike Masnick put together called The Sky is Rising that talks about all the ways in which people are actually doing well in this new economy. And so to me, that's got to be the answer. There's no way that there's, like, Washington does not have the answer for, for um, people who are worried about infringement. And I'm sympathetic. I'm particularly sympathetic with, like, small folks who don't have a lot of energy to go around and send DMCA takedown notices for every bit of infringement that they see of their works online. I get that. You know, it, it can be expensive. But you have to ask yourself, okay, well, fine, it's a problem. What's the right answer to the problem? What's the answer that might actually work? And you know, shifting the burden to ISPs to snoop on their customers and you know, stamp out infringement, making them copyright cops, that's not the right answer. Yes? You know, uh, my high school friend told me that uh, I'm a gifted kid, uh, dance teacher. Uh, I realized that, yes, I am, because in the past, I tried taking classes to produce uh, for movies. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, our my instructor, who used to teach us about porn movies, uh, he you took classes. Yeah, we had a class. Okay. Uh, he gave us a simple logic. He says, if you pay a girl for sex, then it becomes prostitution. And if you want to have sex and not become a, a, a being a sued under prostitution, what you do? You take a camera and pay that girl thousand additional bucks, and say we are going to post this video online on YouTube. Then it becomes a poor uh, business. Uh -huh. uh, so what's your stand where one person who uh, you know pays for sex and it becomes uh, it, he has to face all these law and you know for against prostitution, but uh, when he takes camera and then he posts video on so many free websites, then it becomes a part of business. So I guess like uh, the whole porn industry from that technical point of view, because sex is one of the Fundamental way uh, we exist cannot be copyrighted. Make sense? No. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not following you. So, so yeah, pornography should yeah. not be copyrightable. Yeah, the, what I'm saying because, because there's no creative expression involved. <laughs> sure, because, because sex is such a fundamental thing, and we exist because our parents have taught us, right? Okay, so, 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 okay, so, um, just, you know, the, the IP lawyer's answer to that is that the, the um, minimum for student, uh, creative expression enough to be copyrightable is pretty low. And so the argument would be that where, how you decided where to position the camera, what the lighting was, et cetera, that makes it copyrightable, and so there's creative expression, and, you know, you're done. So as a practical matter, that would be the, the judgment. You know, the ways to really underscore how important this is to fundamental activity 
that we do that's not just about we should have more content for free or you know, you know getting mm -hmm. away from the typical sure. messages for which organizations are criticized for you know just supporting free content or whatever it is you know yeah, yeah. just kind of repackaging it and this is these are you know really fundamental to like everyday activities for people who can't even afford to fight Well, one of the things that in, in, in the international context there's been various versions of the sort of three strikes or six strikes you know, proposed, and um, they've been rejected in many countries, not every country by any means, but in, in some countries for, for just this reason. Now, the ISPs made a, um, a point of emphasizing that no one would be terminated um, under this program, and that's a good thing. But, of course, it does, you know, having your, your service suspended can be a very you know, serious thing, especially depending on what the timing is. And it's not at all clear, like, how long would it take to get it restored? You know, what would be involved there? Again, keeping in mind that people, a lot of people don't have choices. Right? They don't have anywhere else to go. Um, so, you know, imagine, imagine no internets for 24 hours. Just picture your life. No internets, 24 hours. Right? You could do it. <laughs> you could. I've done it. <laughs> no, but it'd be hard. No Google for you. You know, how will you ever find any information? Remember when Wikipedia was dark? And it was like, I can't find information. You have to read books. Um, so, no, 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 but seriously, it is, it is an actually very, very serious thing to even be, you know, suspending someone's account, particularly when, I mean, to me, it's a related thing of you're setting up a whole extra legal system, right, that's going to have real consequences for real people. And, you know, we have a system that has real consequences for real people, and it's called the law. And we have things built into that that are, you know, sometimes inadequate, but are some protections. Those aren't here. We have this sort of pseudo due process, but compared to real due process, this would never suffice. The notion that you have only limited defenses and you only have 10 days to prepare your case to defend yourself. Then notice that it's on you to prove that you're not infringing and you can't even get access to the system that's identified you as infringing in the first place. None of these would fly in a court of law. But of course, this is this whole voluntary thing. And what the ISPs will say is, look, I mean, if you look at your user agreement, your ISP probably says, we can terminate you at any time for any reason. The pressure matter, they don't do that. But now they have this whole system of pressures on them um, to act in all kinds of ways against their own customers. And we've got Hollywood inserting itself into the ISP customer relationship. And all of that, as Julie says, is going to have real consequences for, for real people. And I think that what's going to be really important is to watch this roll out, you know, with eagle eyes. Um, and I think that, as with the IAA lawsuits against music fans, as a practical matter, what's going to happen is they're going to start being problems. And then people, that, and, you know, unfortunately, that's the point at which I think really people start to pay attention because they realize how serious this is. Right now, it's this big abstract document that, you know, 30 people have read. Um, and, you know, it's when it gets rolled out, which unfortunately is really too late, um, that people start getting serious about, about what they, their ISPs have agreed to. Yes? What about companies like Comcast, which are both distributors and ISPs, and also content owners, since they own NBC? Sony is that way, too, a number of them. So yeah. Which side are they are? Are they on both sides? They sell themselves? <laughs> um, there have been people who have suggested that you know those kinds of relationships are are part of also what drove this agreement is that you know the ISPs are um, entangled in many ways you know the, the ISP side and the content side are you know together much more than than you might think um, and it's just a practical matter they have sort of structural things so you know these the head executives are looking over the whole company and they want these two sides to play nice. There's nothing. Um, I mean, it's it's a memorandum of understanding. It's not even a contract. It's, you know, we talk about it as a contract or as an agreement just because it's faster than saying memorandum of understanding. But there isn't a consequence. They can pull out. And in fact, there's a provision at the very end that says if this becomes unworkable or something like that, it's sort of vague, um, you know, anybody can pull out of the agreement. I think the consequence, the reason the ISPs don't do it is the same reasons that they came to the table in the first place. 
Um, and, you know, but again, I feel like, and, I, and I'm not alone in this, you know, this agreement was worked out before January 18th. And on January 18th, the world changed. And I think if they were still negotiating it now, the ISPs would be in a much better position to push back um, on behalf of their subscribers. Um, and so that's why, you know, we really think they should just press the reset button, pull out and start over, or frankly, jettison the whole thing. But, um, you know, if there's going to be anything like this, there should be something where subscribers get involved. Yes? Well, I mean, you know, <clears throat> the whole thing is this was negotiated behind closed doors. So we don't know exactly. Um, I, based on what I hear from talking to people offline, um, the ISPs were not happy about this. They didn't want to agree to this in the first place. It took a long time to negotiate it. Um, what the RIAA initially proposed is very different from how this ended up. I think they probably should get some credit for that. Um, but nonetheless, I think particularly when, um, when government officials got involved, I think that that kind of pushed it. There's a big thing in, in D.C. now, um, since the Obama administration took, um, came in particularly, um, voluntary cooperative efforts. That's what you hear all the time. Voluntary cooperative efforts. That's the answer to online infringement. Everybody's going to work together um, to, and, 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 and the stick in the background is, or legislation. But again, I think that stick has largely been removed, at least for now. Um, but that's, you know, that's the, the drumbeat that, we're gonna, that we hear, and we're going to keep hearing it. Um, we're going to hear it, pressure on payment processors to stop serving payments to, to infringing sites, et cetera, et cetera. Voluntary cooperation. Voluntary. Better than regulation, right? Yes? With uh, ISPs being such a narrow field, are there antitrust implications? There are some folks looking at that, and I don't know the answer because I'm just, I'm not an antitrust lawyer. So I don't know. Um, but there are some folks who have been investigating whether there's some kind of lawsuit to be brought on that basis. Antitrust. Yes. Yes. Are, are most of the cases that have um, been so uh, egregious or stimulating to RIA or to um, various um, lawyers and legal bodies um, from the Hollywood side of things? Open course bar. Yeah. Um, well, there actually there was a, an interesting little. It's not really a case, but um, a fellow named Aaron Swartz um, downloaded a whole lot of journal articles and got in a lot of trouble <laughs> for, for for doing it. Um, but I think that that well, that's kind of ongoing. Um, I don't think we have an actual law on it. And then of course you know there's um, the Google Book settlement, which is a little bit far afield, but I think is going to address some of the fair use issues of, say, you know, copying a bunch of stuff and then only making parts of it available and sort of that, that mass copying uh, context, I think um, the Google Books case may provide some guidance on that. But we're, we're waiting. Yeah. Anybody else? I think Hollywood is going to be dragged kicking and screaming to new business models. That's what I think is going to happen. And I think it's going to happen because enough people are going to say, well, I'm not actually going to participate in your system. I'm going to do something else. Um, and, you know, and, and actually, I tend to think that the, the game changer, what's really cool is we don't actually know, right? We didn't know five years ago. Wait, ten years ago. Was there YouTube ten years ago? No. Well, now a lot of people are making a lot of money on YouTube. Right? And they even heard of it, <laughs> um, you know, several years ago. And, you know, so I'm looking for the next YouTube, the next Facebook, the next Twitter, the next, the next Hulu, except now Hulu's going to suck. But, um, you know, that's, and that's what we have to sort of create the space for. And the only way we're going to get there 
is by if we keep experimenting. That's how you get there. There's really no other way. I mean, what we had for many years was a situation um, where Hollywood had a veto right on innovation. If you can think about this, the classic example is the DVD space. There's been so little innovation with DVD technology, and now, of course, we're starting to abandon it altogether. But there was a reason why. It was because, because of some licensing and, and um, digital rights management um, uh, scenario that's kind of complicated to explain, but as a practical matter, it meant that DVD makers had to go to Hollywood to get permission to innovate. And guess what? Not so much in the innovation, right? So we don't want that world. That's not a good world. We want a world where there's all kinds of experimentations where people take risk, and then you get YouTubes, and then you get Google, you get Facebook, you get Twitter, you get all the great stuff that we haven't even thought of yet. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. It's fun to be here.